Hello, my name is Roger Royce, and I'm going to talk to you today about how international startups can succeed in Silicon Valley. I'm a partner with the International Amlaw 100 law firm of Haynes and Boone in Palo Alto, California, and I work with technology startups, emerging growth, and venture capital. About half of my practice are companies from outside the United States coming into the United States, in particular into Silicon Valley. So that is what we are going to talk about here today. <clears throat> you can read a little bit about me on my slides. If you'd like the slides, just send me an email. I'm happy to share those with you. Roger.Royce with an S at HainesBoone.com. So you probably already know that the Silicon Valley is the headquarters to most of the tech companies in the world, the top ones anyway. There's probably six or seven trillion dollars of market cap between San Jose and San Francisco, which we typically think of as Silicon Valley. And for that reason, companies from all over the world want to be here. Uh, it's home to the, uh, the venture capital industry, or at least half of it, a uh, quarter to half of it, depending on which statistic you look at. And that industry is more than a hundred billion dollars these days. It's growing every year. And obviously it has some of the top tech talent in the world, which is why we see companies from all over the world coming here either for markets, for talent, or for money. I'm just going to hit in the 15 minutes that I have on some of the legal considerations that your company wants to think about when you come into the United States. I'm not going to cover all of these and none of these in any depth, but I do want to give you an outline and a survey of some of the things to think about the corporate law issues, the tax issues, tax reigns supreme and, and making decisions as to how to enter this market. You should think about liability protection, especially here in California, which has very expansive liability laws. Employment and immigration, privacy, it's a big issue here in California, the regulatory environment in the United States, and finally, intellectual property, since I suspect if you're coming here, you are likely a technology company. So let's talk about the very first decision that you have to make. Let's suppose that you've got a successful company in your home country and you want to expand your reach and expand your business in the United States and you want to start here in Silicon Valley. So the first question you have is, gee, should I do business in the U.S. through a branch, which is just an office, or should I do it through a separate wholly owned corporation or business entity? 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer is going to be that you're going to form a United States corporation to act, a, a, a U.S. corporation to act as a subsidiary. And I say United States corporation, but corporations are actually formed under state law, and every state has its own corporate law. Most of the corporations I form are formed under Delaware law. I'll talk about that in a minute. But for now, we want to form a corporation to do business here. Why is that? Number one is liability protection. If foreign company owns 100% of the stock, all of the ownership of the U.S. company, which operates the U.S. business, the liabilities of that U.S. business, they stop at the U.S. company level. The foreign company is not liable for those liabilities. That is the number one reason. California is a very litigious state. It's very easy to get in trouble here. You don't want to bring the whole worldwide operation down if something goes wrong in California. Number two is tax. If the foreign company, the non-U.S. company, operates through a branch, and that can be a permanent establishment for, in tax talk, which means a fixed place of business, or it can be a dependent agent, which means an employee. You will almost always have a branch here if you're doing anything substantial and have any physical presence here in the United States. So if that non-U.S. entity operates through a branch, it's going to be subject to U.S. tax. And that part might not be so bad, but that means that the foreign company has to get into the U.S. federal and state tax system. And most foreign companies don't want to do that. So we put the U.S. company uh, in between the two to prevent that from happening. Where to incorporate? Most of the companies I incorporate are under Delaware law. Now, you've heard of other states. Wyoming is big for crypto. Uh, Nevada is very popular. 
California, if you're only doing business in California and no place else in this country, and you're not going to move out of this state, then you may as well incorporate under California law. Most of the companies I work with, they're going to start in California and then move on into nationwide markets. And there may come a day when they decide to move into another market. The thing is, if you're a California corporation, you're going to be subject to California minimum taxes every year, regardless of whether you have a presence here or not. If you're a Delaware corporation, you won't have that problem. You can actually withdraw from California if you ever stop doing business here. You will always be a corporation, what we call a C corporation. It is really the only option for a non-US entity that makes sense. Uh, you could be a limited liability company, but that does not give you the tax protection that we just talked about, because that would be a complete transparent flow through entity. And you want something opaque that isolates the foreign company from US tax. Now, as I said, that U.S. subsidiary is going to be formed here in order to hire people, access talent, to sell its product or do sales and marketing that's accessed the markets at $7 trillion a market cap, or to solicit investment. I want to talk about that third point for just a minute here. Oftentimes, companies come into Silicon Valley because of our venture capital industry, and they say, yes, we would like to access venture capital financing. And that's fine, that's a perfectly legitimate reason for being here. What you will soon find is that venture capitalists and other investors in this area, they have a very strong preference for investing in Delaware corporations that own everything. So if you have a subsidiary that is a Delaware corporation, it doesn't own everything. The intellectual property is probably owned by the non-US parent. So in order to give your investor a share in that, you would have to issue stock in the non-US parent. Well, investors here, they don't want stock in the non-US parent. They want stock in a Delaware corporation that owns everything. And that's when we do the inbound flip transaction. This is generally an easy thing to do as a US matter. It's generally non-taxable. Sometimes you might have issues on the non-US side, and I defer to local counsel on that. But on the U.S. side, it is generally pretty easy to do. It gets a little bit more complicated if there are U.S. shareholders of your foreign corporation, non-U.S. corporation. But we can easily deal with those issues through certain types of elections we make for tax purposes. Generally, what happens is the shareholders of the non-U.S. corporation exchange all of their stock in exchange for stock of a new U.S. corporation. So when the dust clears, the shareholders now own a U.S. company that owns 100% of a foreign company. The foreign company owns all the IP, probably. The U.S. company owns all of the foreign company. The investors invest in the U.S. company, and that way they get an interest in everything. It's a very common transaction here in Silicon Valley. One of the things you'll find when you start doing business in the United States is we have a very complex regulatory and legal environment. You might say that our law is schizophrenic. On one hand, it encourages open competition and freedom of contract. You can make whatever deal you want to make. On the other hand, we have strong consumer protection and employee protection laws, especially here in California. Secondly, you'll find that we have a federal system and a 50 different state systems. And within the states, different municipalities and governmental subdivisions that also have their own laws. But for sure, you've got 50 states and you have to comply with the laws of all of those states plus the federal government. This is mostly most pronounced in the case of securities issuances because the federal government regulates the sale of securities like stock in your company. So does every state. So we have to be pay attention and be cognizant of all the different rules that might apply. Here's just an example of some of the federal agencies that you might run into if you're doing business here in the United States. I won't go through all of these, that's just an example. I also want to mention for those of you that are engaged in internet related activities, California is a tough place. We have the California Consumer Privacy Act, which is a lot like what other countries have done. You might've heard of the GDPR. California is unique though, it's a little bit different. It requires certain notices be given to anybody that visits your site if you're within the jurisdiction, meaning if you have enough presence, enough hits, enough visitors. 
and it requires you give people the opportunity to opt in or out regarding you saving their identifiable information like such as email addresses. So if your website is interactive at all, you need to pay attention to California's Consumer Privacy Act, as well as some of the other acts. COPA applies to minors. Every company is going to want to have privacy policies on its websites required by law, again, if you're interactive at all. And oftentimes we want really good terms of service, again, if you're doing business through your internet website. Now, I mentioned employees and our employee protection issues, and California is getting to be more and more protectionist of its employees all the time. As of now, we can still have at-will employees. What has changed in the law and what, be a little, what might be a little different here is that California is very expansive as to who it considers to be an employee. And if somebody is an employee, they're entitled to a whole host of protections. Breaks, overtime pay, lunch breaks, uh, et cetera. Benefits sometimes, to participate in benefit plans, uh, payroll tax obligations on behalf of the employer. So it's a big difference. It's about a 30% increase in cost by some estimates to classify someone as an employee as opposed to a contractor. So we need to pay attention to those rules. And I, I won't go through them now, but California's law is very expansive, probably the most expansive in the nation in terms of classifying persons as employees rather than contractors. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about intellectual property protection. Intellectual property rights are local to where you're doing business, meaning that even though you have rights in your home country, you don't have rights in the United States unless they arise under U.S. law. So let's first of all, patents. Everybody understands patents. The utility patent is, of course, that federal registration that gives you protection for your invention, right? And if you file in another country, of course, you can file under the treaty and you've got a grace period with which in the file and you'll get relation back in terms of priority date to the date you filed in the foreign country. But this is something you absolutely must talk to a lawyer about. You must do it quickly because if you miss these time periods, you lose your rights under the patent to file a patent. A design patent, similar to a utility patent, which as it says, it, it's a protection of, of the use. Design protects the features of a product. A copyright is probably less significant. We used to copyright software quite frequently. Now we don't, but a copyright protects original works of authorship. So usually software, if we can fit within a patent for software, we will always do that, even though it is also subject to copyright protection but it is much less, much less significant protection. This is one that people often overlook, and that's trademark. A trademark is really your entire brand is going to be protected by trademark law. And think about the company that you're building and what it is that you're building. If it's associated with your name or your mark or your logo, you need trademark protection. So this is a big mistake companies make, but the first thing you should do is a Google search or some other search engine to find out if anybody is using a name that is very similar to yours and if they're using it in your field. Secondly, we go to the Patent and Trademark Office of the U.S. government and do a knockout search. We do a search through the USPTO. Thirdly, we actually file a registration for a trademark. Now, the federal registration is not required. You get trademark protection by using the mark. However, it does give you priority and a presumption of validity. And it also will smoke out other trademarks that, uh, or other marks that somebody might say that you are infringing. And if you are infringing, you wanna know that sooner rather than later so you can change and rebrand. You don't wanna know right on the verge of a sale of your company. Finally, and this might be the most valuable intellectual property that my clients, technology startups have, and that is trade secret. Now, the trade secret law is governed by state, but we also have a federal trade secret law as well. But under state trade secret law, which usually corresponds to something like the Uniform Trade Secrets Act, trade secret has to have three things. It has to be valuable, it has to be secret, and here's the tough one, it has to be subject to your reasonable efforts to maintain its secrecy. 
And that's the, that's the one that gets a lot of companies. You really have to take reasonable efforts to maintain the secrecy of that trade secret. That means non-disclosure agreements. That means having good security. That means not broadcasting on a public uh, webcast your trade secret. It's all things like that. And companies lose trade secret very easily. It's a very fragile right, even though it's very valuable. So something to be very careful about and pay attention to. So with that, I invite you to take a look at my book, Dead on Arrival, How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Could Kill Your Startup, or my upcoming book that'll be out this winter called 10,000 Startups, Strategies for Legal Success. My name is Roger Royce. I'm a partner with the Amlaw 100 law firm of Haynes & Boone in Palo Alto, California. Thank you for listening.